Good morning. I'm happy to be back with all of you. Um, if you're a guest here this morning, I want to welcome you with, uh, and thank you for joining us. This is our third week now to be back, gathered together. We, we did the internet thing. We had a good time being able to connect with each other still and, and really thankful for those resources to still be able to have a sense of community. But nothing replaces being able to be here with you all and actually see your faces and have conversations with you. So I'm just, I'm really excited to be gathered again with you all. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Jason Thomas. I am the student minister at our Percola campus. And uh, when Jason was going on vacation, he asked if I could come fill in for him one Sunday. So here I am this morning um, sharing with you. So we're continuing our series on Kingdom Upside Down. We began walking through the Sermon on the Mount months ago uh, when we started the Beatitudes. We went through the Beatitudes and then we worked into this series called Kingdom Upside Down and we continue to work through the Sermon on the Mount. And so what Jesus is doing here is he's teaching us what it means uh, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. He's teaching us what it looks like to live as a disciple of the kingdom of God. And this is something that we, we promote here at Cross Community. We really want to make fully devoted disciples of Jesus. And so that's why we're cluing in on what it means to be a disciple of the kingdom of God. And I want to open up this morning with a story. And it's not based on a true story. And I know this because I made it up myself. So you don't have to like fact check it and, and be worried about these two individuals that are having this discussion. This is not a true story. So there's two men, they're having a conversation and they're talking about fire. And they are, they ha their interpretation of fire is the same. They both agree that Fire is this, it's something that's hot, it's a source of energy, it's a source that uh, can be used for many different things, but they, they kind of disagree on the best use of fire, right? One, one says fire is best used when preparing a meal. They say the best way you can ever use fire is to cook a, cook a meal and have something to eat. And then the other one says, well, I disagree. I think the best use of fire is to not freeze, to, to have warmth, to provide that warmth and that comfort that you might need in cold temperatures. And both of these men, they're correct, right? Like their interpretation of fire, what they have to say about it, we can all agree, yes, fire is hot. Yes, it does do these things that they're talking about. But based on the context of their situation, one man may be more correct than the other man, right? So if, if they were in, um, let's say they were need, in need of food, if they were hungry and all they had was some raw chicken and they had fire, well, they're not just going to eat the raw chicken because it's going to make them sick, right? Like they need to cook this meal, they need to prepare it, and then that way they can get the nourishment they need from it and continue on and continue living their days. Now, on the other hand, if they were in some frozen tundra and the cold, unforgiving air was pushing life out of them and their bodies were beginning to, to seize up from the cold, then at that point, the fire would be best used to give them heat and to give them warmth to keep them um, from succumbing to that cold weather. So based on the situation, the fire can be used one way or another. And so just as I believe fire can be applied in different scenarios, I also think that scripture can be applied in different areas of our life, uh, depending on what our context of that situation is. Now, I want you to hear this. I'm not saying scripture can be interpreted differently, right? Like we have one interpretation for scripture. There's one meaning, uh, but I mean more specifically the application of that scripture. And I'm not talking about uh, matters of theology, uh, the character of God. I'm not talking about matters of salvation. We know that there is one true way to Jesus Christ, and that is through Jesus alone. Um, but I do think there are some matters that can be applied in different ways depending on the situation you find yourself in. So today we're going to be in Matthew 7, uh, verses 7 through 11. That's kind of our primary text this morning. Uh, you may know this as the section over ask, seek, knock. You've probably heard that before. If you've gone through Bible school, anything like that, you've heard ask, seek, knock before. Now, as I was studying this text during my sermon prep, um, I found some application of these verses that's kind of outside of my usual application. See, when I read these, I would always think like, okay, this is, this is just about my needs, right? Like anytime I have needs, go in prayer, go in prayer. And that's not wrong. That's not incorrect to think that. But as I looked more and as I studied and as I sought out some discussion with other uh, individuals who have more knowledge than myself, who have more wisdom, um, I began to see that this could be applied in other areas as well, outside of just my needs. And I believe that we, we can apply this section in our lives to utilize prayer to further not only our relationship with God, but our relationship with others as well. And so I want to start uh, by reading the verses, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. 
Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now what I want to do is I want to look at the very next word in in verse 12. I don't want to read the full verse yet, but I want to look at that next word. And all it says is so. It says so. And so when we look at this word, we see the word so, what it should cause us to do is to pause and take a second and say so. All right, so that means whatever was just said is going to have some implication of what's to follow. So when we look at this, it's going to cause us to look at the full context of what we're reading. And so if we look back at the beginning of chapter 7, we'll find that Jesus' teaching on judging others. And so let's read over those now, Matthew 7, 1 through 6. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, when I read this, I just, I see that we as Christians really struggle with this, this passage in particular. We really struggle with this. Hear me say this, judgment is not bad. Right? Like we, we get the sense that judgment is just like, it's almost a curse word. Like, oh, you can't judge. You, you, you can't judge. Christians shouldn't be judgmental. But judgment is not bad. It is biblical. Judgment is encouraged and it is fruitful. Judgment is necessary for growth. But we can really get this part so wrong. Our judgment should be directed towards other brothers and sisters of the faith. We need to stop holding the world up to the standards of Christ because, frankly, the world doesn't care about Christ. Our judgment isn't meant to judge and look down on unbelievers in the world. Our judgment is meant to help us walk with fellowship with brothers and sisters toward sanctification and into deeper relationship with Christ and with one another. Those outside of the kingdom are not strong candidates for correction. But hear me say this. This does not mean that we should just dismiss unbelievers and say, you know what, all right, they're on their own. We should keep each other accountable, but as far as the world goes, it doesn't matter. That's not our problem. That's, that's not what I'm saying. We cannot and we should not lose our evangelical mindset. There are still lost souls out there that need the gospel. They need the truth of Jesus Christ. However, judging non-believers and condemning them for their actions will most likely do more harm than good. It will never be fruitful. It will not cause them to want to ask more and know more about Jesus. It's going to push them away. The love of Christ abounds any barrier. It abounds any obstacle that could be in our path. And we should extend that love to non-believers, not judgment to them. So we see before the ask, seek, knock passage, Jesus is teaching on judging others. So let's look at the verses after ask, seek, knock, or just that one verse really is what I want to focus on. Matthew 7, 12. So there's the word that we looked at that made us look at the context. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We know this is the golden rule, more simply do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, Even though our judgment is reserved for other believers, it's reserved for those who would call themselves Christians, we can still apply the golden rule to those who are outside the kingdom of God. As Christians, knowing what we know, if the shoe was on the other foot, if we were an unbeliever and they were a believer, would we not want them to tell us about the gospel? Knowing what we know now as believers in Christ, knowing that Christ is the only way to salvation, is the only way to eternity, would we not want that person to share the gospel with us so that we may know, so we know who Jesus, know who Jesus is and know what it means to walk in union with him? So if I was to have someone do unto me as I would want them to, uh, to have done, then I would want someone to tell me about the gospel. I would want to know the truth of Jesus Christ. So let's recap. We have a section on judging others with some verses about how your standard of judgment will be used against you. And then we have the ask, seek, knock section. And then we have the golden rule. And so it's my belief that we can apply ask, seek, knock in our reconciliation with others in order to help us resolve disagreements. On Monday, uh, my wife Emily and I, we celebrated our one-year anniversary. And so we made a trip down to Branson, or up to Branson. I guess it's more up than down. Um, 
and we had our honeymoon there. We thought, okay, we're going to go for a couple days and enjoy some time there. We made an agreement before that we're going to kind of stay off social media. We're really just going to be intentional with our time together and really enjoy that time together. And so as a result, we, we weren't really plugged into what was going on in the world. Well, Thursday comes, and, and we start kind of scrolling back on social media. And what we find is heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching. It's hard. It's divisive. It's, it's difficult. It's just terrible things, and that's, it's almost too much to look at. And this, this, this sermon that I wrote, I wrote last weekend about conflict and about division and resolving conflict. I don't think that it was any accident that this message was what was prepared for today. Because right now, you get on social media and there's conflict. There's Christians fighting with Christians. There's Christians fighting with unbelievers. It's just, it's a war zone out there. I think that these steps can help us not only be reconciled with other Christians, but also build relationships who are unbelievers who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. So utilizing Ask, Seek, Knock. When applying Ask, Seek, Knock, we need to discern first if the person that we are in disagreement with is a fellow citizen of the kingdom. If this person is an unbeliever, then the standards of biblical righteousness don't apply to them because they don't confess to live by those standards. In this case, we need to look for opportunities to share the gospel with them without judgment. And then the golden rule is clear on how to proceed once we know this person is a brother or sister in Christ. Approach them in a way that I would want to be treated. So how would I want someone to approach me if they found error in my life? If they saw something that I was doing wrong, how would I want them to come to me with that? Well, I would want them to approach me with respect and not just immediately assume the worst of me because of one rumor they heard about me. I would want them to approach me with good intentions and not with an attitude of destruction. I would want them to have the condition of my heart at the core of their intentions, not just merely falling to rumors. With that in mind, I believe these verses can point us in a manner in which we can approach conflict. So Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. When conflict arises, when the, when the coals of anger begin to burn and the seeds of distrust and uncertainty begin to take root and begin to blossom, we must, must ask the Father for guidance. Our first step should be to ask God for wisdom, understanding, direction, discernment, and gentleness in dealing with conflict. Now, I don't believe this passage limits our prayers to matters of conflict. I believe it can be applied to many things, but I do believe that when conflict arises, this is a great place to start. Begin with asking God for guidance, but also ask questions to those you're in conflict with. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Go to that person and have a conversation with them. Have a discussion with them. Don't just accuse and attack them of things that you don't even really know about. What if, rather than making declarations about someone and believing the worst about them after the first rumor we heard, what if instead we ask them for their perspective on the matter? So much drama could be avoided if we just went to the source of any conceived issues rather than spreading the disease of gossip and rumor. Ask questions to really understand what is going on. Now, there are, there are good questions to ask, but there are also some bad questions to ask, right? Like I've seen some of them uh, on Facebook. Some of them like, are you stupid? That's not a good question to ask. Or how can you really believe this? Are you, are you serious right now? Again, not a good question to ask. Those are kind of rhetorical, right? Because you're led to believe that this person already knows the answers to that question. But also they're just mean. They're just going to force a wedge between them and there's not going to be any progress made there. So what are some good questions to ask? Some good ways to go about it? A better way would be, hey, I, I heard, I, I don't want to assume anything about you, but I heard that there's some stuff going on. Maybe, do you want to talk to me about it? Hey, I, I've heard that uh, something may be happening, and I don't want to just believe rumors, but I want to hear from you instead. How, how can I help you? How can I pray for you? What can I do? I, I care about you, and I love you, and I want to see you thrive. Instead of trying to just throw darts and assume the worst, ask questions and get to know. If they begin to open up to you, then you can begin to ask other diagnostic questions. Well, why do you feel that way about this? Or can you help me understand what it is that's going on? You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of lost. I may not know the full story. Help me understand your perspective. Help me understand what's going on. They may give you an answer that you aren't ready for. 
that's okay. That is why you have a community here to help and support you and encourage you and those you're doing life with. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for support. Asking questions is a much better approach than just assuming the worst about those uh, who are in your life. Now, after asking some questions and finding out more about the issue, we can then seek to understand their perspective and not merely dismiss it. Matthew 7, 7 continues saying, seek and you will find. Seek the Father out in prayer. This is the second invitation to prayer in the same sentence. Seek scripture for the ultimate source of authority on the matter. While seeking scripture, really put in effort to understand both sides, really understand their point of view. Examine what you and they both believe through the lens of scripture and see what the word of God has to say about it. Again, you need to be prepared to be humbled through this experience because you might find out that your perspective was skewed all along. You had it wrong from the very beginning. You didn't really know, but now your eyes have been opened. Be ready to be humbled in this experience and be willing to seek counsel if you hit a wall of doubt or uncertainty. Maybe you approach them when you say, hey, you know what, I love you, I care about you, and they say, I don't have time for this. I've got my own issues going on, I've got my own problems, I, I don't have time to deal with these rumors that you're coming at me with, I just don't have time for it. Maybe you approach them and they dismiss you immediately. And this is a perfect time to seek out wisdom from others. Matthew 18, 16 says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. The best case scenario would be that you go to your brother or sister and you begin having this conversation, having this discourse, and, and you understand one another and they say, you know, I appreciate you coming to me with this. It means so much that you came to me instead of just believing what you heard. Thank you so much. And, and then you begin walking together. You continue towards sanctification. You continue in your discipleship towards Jesus Christ. That is the best case scenario. But scripture is clear in the process if that's unsuccessful. Gather with two or three others. Go to the church. And then if they still continue to not want to have anything to do with it, it's up to them from there to seek out that reconciliation. You've done everything you can. You've followed the steps as set out by scripture. Lastly, knock at the door. Approach God in prayer and knock at the door for answers you are seeking. This is now the third time in the same sentence that Jesus is encouraging us to prayer. By knocking on the door, God may open doors to you that were not previously open before. You may have a new understanding or a new perspective. I would also recommend that you knock at the door of those you're in conflict with. Uh, Imagine you want to go have a conversation with someone. You say, you know, I want to sit down and have this discussion. And you go to their home and you begin the conversation by kicking in their door and sitting on their couch. They're probably not going to be very receptive to what you have to say. They're probably even going to be ready to come at you with violence because they think they're under threat. Aggression is not the way to handle this. Don't force your opinions on them. Approach them with a sense of gentleness. And reassure them that you are there for their good and not for your own ego. Not to boost yourself up and feel better about yourself. But you are truly there for their good. So ask questions. Seek understanding. And knock at the door. I want to close with this. Beyond all of this, we must remember verse 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Again, I don't believe this, con this, this application for this passage is limited to matters of conflict. I think that it can, it can be for anything going on in your life. If you seek God out, I believe uh, they can apply to any area. Three times Jesus commands us to pray. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be opened. This repetition is meant to convey that Jesus really, truly means this. He wants you to get this. He wants you to know to go in prayer. We can trust that God's goodness, trust in God's goodness because we have already been adopted as children. St. Augustine said this, For what would he not now give to sons when they ask, when he has already granted this very thing, namely, that they might be sons? As a child of God, you have a good father who loves you and wants what is best for you. He wants you to ask for the things that you need in your life. He wants you to seek him out in pursuit of those things, and he wants you to knock at the door so that it can be opened. Now, does this mean that everything we ask for, we get? I think we all know that that's not true, right? We all have probably prayed for something and it not happened in our life. 
John Piper would answer that question like this. Does this mean that everything a child of God asks for, he gets? No. We do not get everything we ask for, and we should not, and we would not want to. The reason I say we should not is because we would, in effect, become God if God did everything we asked him to do. We should not be God. God should be God. And the reason I say that we would not want to get everything we asked is because we would then have to bear the burden of infinite wisdom, which we do not have. We simply don't know enough to infallibly decide how every decision will turn out and what the next events in our lives, let alone in history, should be. This is not a message on prosperity, but rather about trusting that God knows your needs and will meet them. His ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. You may not ever understand everything that goes on in your life, but you you have to trust that you have a father who is infinitely good, infinitely wise, infinitely powerful, and infinitely loving, and that he will keep you and sustain you. If you guys would pray with me.